In this video, I would like to discuss mixed dentition model measuring and how to manage missing or uninterrupted teeth for any type of model measuring in SmileStream DentalCAD. My colleagues, Dr. Dana and Dr. McGann, have both made videos regarding model measurement, but both of their examples are in full dentition cases. Many of my doctors have confusion about how to trace a mixed dentition model, so I hope I can resolve those problems by uh, look, I mean by showing you this video example. So I have a young patient here who happens to be about nine years old and it's probably late nine years old and you can see there's one upper first bicuspid coming in right now and when the fours come in that is usually around age 10 so the age is appropriate for that. Another thing that you see is uh, there's a missing lateral incisor right here uninterrupted or missing or whatever Dental CAD is great because it will not let you skip any teeth. So when we get to this point, I'll show you how I personally like to manage that. Okay. And <clears throat> the other thing I want to do is I'd like to count the crowding just by eyeball so that we know how much crowding we're dealing with. So crowding is always counted from the mesial of 6 to the mesial of 6. And don't worry about the teeth underneath here. I want you to count the crowding just as you see it. So I've got maybe a two millimeter overlap there and that all looks even so the bottom the bottom's going to be about a two millimeter crowded in my opinion and then in the upper the patient has a really big lateral incisor we'll look at that in a few minutes and see what I'm talking about so I can see maybe two on that side two on that side so there's four millimeters of crowding against maybe an eight millimeter missing two so that's twelve less one or two, so call it 10 or 11 crowding in the, in the upper. And don't worry about the E space and all that stuff. I'll show you that coming up in a minute. So the first thing we just click on 3.6 distal and the points start. Notice for every point that you check there's a tutorial down here and you can click it open and you can look and see exactly where that point is supposed to go. So that is an excellent excellent tool built into the dental CAD software. Number two thing I'd like you to do, I'd like you to zoom this up to make sure that you can see things clearly. All right? And I think that's one of the problems is many docs just trace it the way they see it. So 3.6 distal and notice my pointer is pretty sharp at the end so I can place that with quite a bit of confidence. That buckle pit is where you stick the burr in there to do the buckle pit restoration on the lower, right there. I know a lot of you put it right on the cusp tips or in the middle of the occlusal table, and that's not correct. So 3.6M and then 3.5D. And notice that I put the points not right on top of each other. It makes them too difficult to move if you ever want to move anything. And then as I make this next point, I'm looking at the previous point because I want a red line to go between them that will mimic the facial surface of the tooth so that it will have the same parallelism as the tooth for rotation bracket selection. That would be if you were doing a permanent tooth model, not a mixed dentition model. All right, and then the contact points here look pretty much perfect. And I could go here and then 3, 2, M. 3, 1. These two are right on top of each other. They're perfectly aligned, so I have to click them right into place. And then distal M. Good. Distal. And the buckle again. Good. All right. We're almost done with the lower buckle pit. And that. And you know it automatically takes you to the distal point of the upper six. And then the next thing is a buckle, same thing as always. That's where the bracket would go, or the band, if you will, the, <clears throat> the attachment. And the next thing is the cusp tip. And those of you who have heard me lecture before, you know, I always talk about this when I lecture. It goes on the cusp tip. It does not go here on that lobe right there. So it goes on the cusp tip. That's so that you have a proper horizontal relationship with the molar. And I see a lot of problems related to that. All right, so we just do the same thing here. 
And again, zoom that up to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And I see this problem very frequently in the incisors. Students want to put the points here at that transitional line angle where it goes from proximal to incisal. But you have to tell the software the true mesial distal width of the tooth. Sometimes that point needs to be technically out in space for that to happen. So here you go. Ah, now we're missing a tooth. So uh, I personally like to put it out here right in front of where it goes. Many of you were taught to put it right on top of the tooth. That's okay, but don't put the points right on top of the other points. It's way too hard to find it if we want to move it or extract it or resize it or whatever. So let me uh, do this. I'm just going to put a couple of points out here and I'll show you how to make it more accurate in a moment. And then the mesial at the cuspid, the primary cuspid that is, and the distal And then a buckle, remember that's out there where the bracket would go, cuss tip, not in the middle of the tooth. And automatically it takes you to archware size, excuse me, shape. And the way the software was designed is that shape is supposed to match this lingual shadow right here. And I want you to study that carefully, the thing that I'm tracing with the cursor. And now I'm going to fit the shape of the mandible into that. That looks good right there. I see so many students putting it right here, which doesn't help you at all. As far as the archware shape is concerned, that's not how it was designed. The shape of this is supposed to give you the rough shape of what the archwire will be. In addition, this is going to indicate uh, the long axis, excuse me, the center line of the mandible, or I should say where the teeth fall in relationship to the face. Next thing we're going to pick is the archwire. And you know how this goes. It's going to be average incisal edge, theoretical brackets, and posterior teeth. So if I put this right here, I'll turn on some vectors for us. And sure enough, that looks like average incisal edge. Half and half, half behind, a little bit behind, and a lot behind. Let's move it a little bit back. Maybe right there. Okay. And how does the midline look? Looks pretty close. Theoretical brackets in posterior teeth, that looks pretty good. I see so many docs put wires on here that are so small. They look like, <clears throat> oops, we'll say something like this. And it's on top of the cusp tips, some of them are even tighter than that. Like here, a small taper. And they just accept that. But this would actually be a very constricting arch wire because remember the brackets are way out here on the lower molar. So it's theoretical brackets and posterior teeth to be the correct width. Excuse me, the correct wire. All right, then automatically we go to the next thing and that's the upper arch wire. Same thing, it's going to start with a medium ovoid and you're going to put it on an average incisal edge. So everything is probably, you know, half and half, half and half, half and half, and then this is clearly out front. All right, so that looks like a good wire, good points, and everything else. Now, let's turn off the points for a sec, and you can use this to edit the model, and notice how much more accurate it is with these little tiny green squares versus those great big giant orange dots. So you can see I had a little bit of an error right here. That's not exactly correct. All right, now let's use the measure tool to see what the width of the incisor was. Those of you who have heard me lecture before, you know I talk about this size of teeth all the time. And the upper lateral should be about 7.2 millimeters. That's the average. And look at how big this one is. It's 8.6 millimeters. So uh, one way you could do it is put the grid tool on. And here on the grid, you could use that grid to make it go to 8.6 which would be somewhere around there's 9, 8, 8.6. That's one way to do it. Or another way to do it, make it be where it should go, if you could get it in there, and then use the measure tool 
to help you make it be 8.5 millimeters, presuming it's going to be the same size. So there's a 7.2, there's an 8.2, 8.4, so we've got to extend that out a little bit. until you get it to be the right size. Yep, there you go. 8.5 is close enough. So now you have model and you put the tooth in there. And again, it doesn't matter if it's inside or outside the arch, anywhere you want it. As long as it's on the page, Dental CAD will count it. So grid tools are a good way to help you. Measure tools are another good way to help you. And I know most of my colleagues put it right on top of this tooth, but don't put it right on top of that. And what I mean by that is I see this all the time. The student puts it right here, and then it takes forever to find it, you know, like because I know you can't skip any teeth. So it's a good idea to put it someplace else. Oops. So again, doctors, this is my personal preference. This is not the opinion of POS. And I don't care what tooth is missing. This is a good way to do it. And I'll estimate the size of that again, and we'll get that back. So let me remind you, our count was 2 in the bottom and 11 crowded in the upper. So when I press that button, that's what I'd like to see. And when I don't see it, then I'm going to adjust it to make it be what it should be. Okay? So it points to the best of your ability. Wire goes in the correct position on the incisors at theoretical brackets on posterior teeth. Now don't mess with that. Let's go look. At what the crowding count is, so I can unzoom this. And you know, <clears throat> so when I press the button, I get four in the bottom and eleven in the upper. So my guess is right on for the upper. Now the lower, I have to adjust some out of this to make it be two. And oh, docs, I see this. I'm going to say 99% of the cases I get for diagnosis, there's errors in the model just like that. If you make VTOs and so forth based on this, they're going to be not as accurate as they should be because the data is not right. So all you have to do now, you can get rid of the arch wires, put this back on here, zoom it up, and I'm not going to change the width of the incisors. And again, you've heard me lecture about the size of teeth. Laterals are about six, centrals are five and a half. And here we go, 6.759616565, pretty good size incisor teeth. So all we have to do is move a couple of bicuspid points so that I can make some space in the arch. And I want that number to go down to 2. I have it at 2.9 right now, so I hope you see how easy that was to make that work. 2.4, that's within 1, that's close enough. So now you have a good model to work with, and then you can go on your merry way and do whatever you're going to do with this. Notice that this is an ortho select, and normally I do it right at the beginning, but ortho select almost always comes in the perfect size. But here's how you would check it. You take the ruler tool, and you go from here to 100, and sure enough it says 100, so that tells you that the image is the right size. Okay? And if you're interested, now you know the leeway space, that is the, the C, the D, and the E, are generally larger than the 3, 4, and 5 that will replace it. And that's leeway space is 1.7 per side, so you just kind of round that off to 1.5 or 3 millimeters of difference. So right now if I have 2 millimeters of crowding and I take away the leeway space, that means I'm going to hold the space with a lingual arch, then I should end up with something around one millimeter of space in there. And here I have crowding of two. So notice that it didn't follow the rules and so forth, but if you want to see what the permanent tooth crowding would be, you look right down here. And the way that works is this primary tooth, I'm sorry, the permanent tooth crowding down here, the way the computer calculates that, it just measures the four incisor teeth and then it aligns them, and it takes the distance from the mesial of <clears throat> the 6 to the distal of the 2, like from here to here, and it makes a calculation about what you're going to have. So notice that number right now is 2.4, and this one is 2.6. So
So if I make this space, right, I'll change this back here, and then I can get a lot of difference in both of those amounts because I changed the side, the distance from the initial 2 to the distal the 6. <clears throat> but here, let me change this one, and I'm going to move an E point back. And now the E point being smaller, notice it didn't change this one bit because the computer doesn't care about the size of the baby teeth. But look here, it changed that by 4 millimeters because I moved this by 4 millimeters. So the value you see up here at the top, this, oops, this is as if you had permanent teeth in here. And the value you see down here is what you will have based on the size of the incisor teeth and the distance between the distal of the two and the mesial of the six. So <clears throat> remember those two things are different and you let the computer calculate out what that crowding is going to be after all the teeth come in presuming you hold it with a lower lingual arch. So our target was two again docs so let me take away a little bit more and I want to get that to two and <clears throat> that's 2.6 is close enough. So I don't care if it's permanent tooth or mixed dentition Everybody, I want you to count the crowding that you see with your eyeball. Then I want you to write that down in ink so you can't change your mind. Do the model measuring and then make the model measure agree with reality. Okay? So I hope you found that helpful. You can watch that as many times as you need to to get that right. Maybe I'll make one for permanent tooth alignment as well since I have such a lot of compliments on those YouTubes. All right, docs, thank you for watching, and I hope that was educational.